Well, getting ready, moving into Christmas season next week. Uh, we will uh, turn this facility around a little bit, uh, spruce it up with some spruce, I guess, and uh, it's going to look nice for the holidays, for Christian uh, Christmas holiday coming up. Pat, I wanted you to know, uh, banana pudding is one of my favorite Christmas dishes, so we're counting on you to bring that to the fellowship meal uh, next week, and I'm sure it's yours as well. All right. Turn in your Bibles, please. We're going to take the day, uh, one day away from 1 Corinthians as we're moving through uh, that letter. We're going to look today at Thanksgiving and the steadfast love of the Lord. You just had an opportunity to say about 24, 25, 26 times together, His steadfast love endures forever. And that was not, that was not a meaningless repetition. Uh, it was an exclamation point to everything that was stated about who God is, what he has done, the hope we have in him. We're looking at this same idea, this steadfast love of the Lord in Psalm 107, verses 1 to 32. We're going to see in this uh, four movements, uh, four assertions. A couple of these, the first two, uh, tell us the, the why we should give thanks to God. I hope you're thankful today. Uh, people are giving thanks for all kinds of things, by the way. You know, the, the Oklahoma Sooner fans are giving thanks for a 59-56 win the other night. The Oklahoma State fans, we're doing counseling for them uh, in the aftermath of their game. Uh, Texas A&M fans are giving thanks for uh, for a seven, seven overtime victory, the first time to beat LSU in the SEC, 74 to 72. There's a lot of things are given. There's a whole lot more reason to give thanks, though, than those things. Those are wonderful. They make our hearts glad. But the Lord, the steadfast love of the Lord. We're going to see this over and over. So I want to go ahead and tell you right now, the word steadfast that you read in Psalm 136 is the, is the Hebrew word hesed. It is the covenant love of God. It is, it is the reason we know that having loved us in eternity past, he will continue to love us now and will love us into eternity future. It is not a love of God that's an emotion attached to how he feels about us or how he thinks we feel about him. It is his chesed. It is his covenant love. His very being is committed to loving us. And this psalm is going to tell us what he's done to remind us. In fact, it's called the, the Pilgrim's Psalm. Two weeks from this Tuesday will mark 398 years since our Pilgrim forefathers landed uh, at Plymouth. Remember Tom and Debbie White, some of you remember them. They were members here several years ago in the military. He wrote in, on Facebook that, that he is a direct descendant, great, great or great, great grandfather, 14 generations removed from Peregrine White, who was the first baby born on the shores of Plymouth as they came over here. So this pilgrim psalm, the, the, the pilgrims identified closely with this psalm whose background is the coming out of the Babylonian captivity. And they themselves, when they landed at Plymouth, were gripped with the sense that God had delivered them not only from a captivity that they were in in England so they could come and worship freely here, but he had delivered them through many uh, dangers, trials, and storms. <laughs> as they landed here. Stand with me if you would. I want to read all 32 ver verses. There's more verses beyond this. We're taking this section today, and I've added a verse to what your bulletin says, Psalm 107, verses 1 to 32. Follow along as I read. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way 
no way to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquity suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food. They drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds and songs of joy. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. What a breathtaking passage. The delivering hand of God. You've known it in your life. I've known it in my life. And if God lets us live much longer, we will know it again in new and fresh ways. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord take this Word today, press it to our hearts, provoke in us a spirit of thanksgiving more intense than we have known in recent days. And then may we do, may we be found doing what we're told in here happens when we remember God's steadfast love to us, how we give thanks to Him while we give thanks to him. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, as I said, Psalm 107, perhaps more than any other portion of the Bible, aptly applies to the, to the pilgrimage made by our pilgrim fathers, the Puritans and the Separatists who traveled over here from England because they were under oppression, under the, under the heavy thumb of the king, uh, in England, religion and state had, had married one another, uh, and religion ebbed and flowed depending on who was head of state and what was going on. And so our forefathers who had in them, as every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve has in them, eternity in their hearts were, were uneasy, uneasy, that there was one who was usurping the sovereignty of their God. So they left. They crossed the Atlantic Ocean. They landed at what we know to be Plymouth Rock. William Bradford, who was the governor of that colony, has an account of the Plymouth Plantation. He explicitly referred to Psalm 107 uh, when he sum summarized their achievement. He said this, May not and ought not the children of these fathers rightly say, Our fathers were Englishmen, which came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness, but they cried unto the Lord, and he heard their voice and looked on their diversity. Let them therefore praise the Lord, because he is good, and his mercies endure forever. Yes, let them which have been redeemed of the Lord show how he has delivered them from the hand of the oppressor. When they wandered in the desert wilderness out of the way and found no city to dwell in, both hungry and thirsty, their souls were overwhelmed in them. Let them confess before the Lord his loving kindness, his wonderful works before the sons of men. This is 
William Bradford's comments telling about the Plymouth Plantation. The pilgrims came ashore on December 11, 1620. And they did that after they'd spent a day, their last day on the ship uh, in Sabbath worship. It's fascinating to study the story. You would have thought that they could not wait to touch land. But they couldn't wait to worship God for his steadfast love in keeping them. And some have said there's reason to believe that this psalm may have been that particular Sabbath meditation on the ship before they disembarked. Psalm 105, 106, and 107 form a, form a trilogy of psalms uh, recounting Israel's experience from the time of when God made covenant with Abraham to the people's entrance into the promised land. And you will recognize that language in Psalm 107 either, their wilderness wandering. Psalm, Psalm 106 tracks the unfaithfulness during the same period of time. Psalm 107 thanks God for their deliverance from that exile. And it was written on the, in the aftermath of the Babylonian exile. And our pilgrim fathers really empathized with the language of the psalm. Charles Spurgeon wrote that the theme of this psalm is thanksgiving and the motives for it. And so that's what we said in this psalm. You see, you see what the Lord has done. You see why we should give thanks. And then we're told in the last couple of stanzas how we should give thanks. When you read a psalm like this, one writer suggested that you, you ask the probing personal question, am I among the redeemed? Because this, this psalm is all about what God has done for his people and is willing to do for anyone who will come to him by grace through faith. Am I among the redeemed? Am I one who's been delivered from sin, been gathered from my aimless secular wanderings to be a part of the, of the well-loved, well-grounded, well-established covenant people? Because, it is again, it's covenant love. It's not a general or generic love that God has for all of creation as the creator. This is his covenant love that he has for those whom he will, has redeemed, will redeem, and bring home to glory. Romans says it's, it's a mark of an unregenerate person that they neither glorify God as God nor give thanks to him. Put it down. An unthankful person is an unredeemed person. Because even if everything that you can imagine in life is going wrong for you and yet you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then your story is praising my Savior all the day long. When other things around you are not giving you confidence, assurance, you can say blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And so it's a check on us. A grumbling spirit, a con and look, all of us can have an episode of grumbling. Grumbling doesn't make us unredeemed, <laughs> nor does it make us unredeemable, thank the Lord. But it's, a, it's, it's the tone of life. It's the tenor of life. You wouldn't set up a fellowship of grumbling Christians. That you, it, it, wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be meaningful because it's, it's counterproductive to the spirit birthed in us in the new birth, making us partakers of the divine nature. The main body of the psalm is what we're looking at today, verses 4 to, to 32, and they're very poetic. So I want us to, to see, uh, first of all, as we give thanks to God, thanksgiving for the steadfast love of God, the covenant love of God, that he's the God who sustains, say that in verses 4 to 9, he's the God who gives freedom, 10 to 16, he's the God who heals the sick, 17 to 22, and he's the God who rescues, 23 to 32. First of all, he's the God who provides. When the Jews were taken into captivity, they felt homeless. On the willows, they say, they hung up their harps. How could they sing the Lord's songs in a foreign land? They were homeless. 
Perhaps you have known that. It grieves me when I see people on the side of the road holding up signs, no place to stay, no place to live. And I honestly think about several things with them, but one of this, how could a person get so unattached? I believe any one of us here were we to find ourselves in the street would have someone here who would say, we want to help. That's what family does. So I, I see those kind of things as you drive around town. You read about it. You think, how do you become so disconnected? When we were made for relationships, how do you, how do you sever so many relationships that when you find yourself in the street, there is no place where someone will take you in. And the people in, in bondage in Israel and the people fleeing what they saw as bondage from England felt detached. And that, listen to what we're told about Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Verses 4 to 6, some wandered in desert ways, finding no way to a, to a city to dwell in. Hungry, thirsty, their, their soul fainted within them. They, they thought they would, uh, in the, particularly as they, were, as they were traveling through the wilderness, coming out of uh, Egyptian bondage, they cried to the Lord in their trouble. I don't know if you, if you live this, they cried to the Lord in their trouble. Oh, God, help. Oh, Lord, deliver. Lord, provide. And every time we're told this, and he delivered them from their distress. Jesus promised that all that the Father gives him will come to him, and whoever comes, he will not turn away any. In fact, you read through the New Testament, we've made a point of this through the years, that every, when you read through the New Testament, everywhere in the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels, someone cried out for mercy. They were shown mercy mercy except one place. And that was when the man cried out for mercy from hell. Too late. But if you're breathing this earth's atmosphere, if there's pink under your fingernail and you cry out for mercy from God, you have every reason to believe that if you belong to him, he will show mercy. And if you've never come to know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, and you cry out for saving mercy today, he has promised he will not turn away any who cry out to him for such. The mercy of the Lord. Verses 7, 8, 9, he led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. So they didn't have one before that. And then they cried out, and then the Lord led them. And so how, what's the response? Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. His covenant love. Lord, remember your covenant with your people. How many times do we see that in the scriptures? His covenant love. And his covenant love is not, it's not ever, and gee, I, I sure care a lot for you. No. And his, the wondrous works to the children of man. Sons of Adam, daughters of Eve. God who made these in his image is touched. He's moved with compassion by your struggle, my struggle. He satisfies. What does he do when, when they cry out to be sustained? He satisfies the longing soul. The hungry soul he fills with good things. Never everything we want. Boy, this is the season, isn't it? We're heading into the season. This is the season of programmed covetousness. Act now. You get two. Best deals ever in the history of advertising. We're, you can look in your paper, according to what it says, and the best deals ever in the history of advertising. And you need this. Not everything we want, but everything we need. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing I need. And that's our God, the God who sustains. And you see this in the life of Israel. You see this in the, in the pilgrim journey from England to our shores. Secondly, he's the God who gives freedom. He gives freedom. 
to captives. Look at 10 to 16. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they'd rebelled against the words of God. They'd spurned the counsel of the Most High, so he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. That's a description of what, what was developing and intensifying in the, in the years in Egyptian bondage. It's a description of the, of the captivities that took place. The Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity. It's a description of the pilgrims and what they were escaping, being imprisoned for, uh, for not being obedient to the state. And it may well become a description of us in this land. We need to learn from this. Then they cried out, verse 13, they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and he burst their bonds apart. Interesting what a difference this is. What a contrast this is from Psalm 2, where the wicked and the rebellious say, that they want to break the bonds that they see that have been imposed upon them by God's law. They want to shatter those so they can live as they want. We'll not have this one to rule over us, they say in Psalm 2. And yet in this Psalm, it is the one who rules over us who shatters the bonds of sin, who shatters the bonds of our captivity to a society. They cried out. He gave freedom. It's one of the things Jesus preached in Nazareth. He read from the scroll of Isaiah. He has set at liberty the captives. And then he said, what I've just read to you is fulfilled by my presence among you. I am the fulfillment of that. And they wanted to kill him for that, you know. No, it is the work of God. The, mo the most dangerous bondage today and I see it in people, is the people who think that they're free. <laughs> but their freedom causes them to pursue everything but God. Their lusts, they cannot fill up their lusts enough. And they think they're free. And it's a tragic observation of utter bondage. He brought them out, tore their bonds. So the response, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts into the bars of iron. Do you remember that in your life? When the Lord acted that way on your behalf and set you free, saved you by his grace for his glory. When you became aware that one of those for whom Jesus died, when we're told that he that he conquered sin and death and hell and the grave, and he led captivity captive. He, he took those who'd been in cap captivity, and he said, I'm going to capture you for me. And that his capturing us for him meant that we'd be brought into the circle of love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. People of Israel knew this experientially when they were set free. Those who were set free from Egyptian bondage, those who centuries later would be set free and be allowed to return home from captivity. The pilgrims facing incredible dangers on the high seas. Several died along the way. Households were decimated. The first winter, uh, it's, it's a mercy of God they didn't all starve to death. Yet they, were, they saw where they were headed as freedom. And they saw what they were fleeing as bondage. They were often put in prison in England for being dissenters. Uh, they didn't line up uh, with the established church of England. Again, William Bradford in his journal. Pitiful it was to see the heavy case of these poor women in distress. What weeping and crying on every side. Some of their husbands that were carried away. Others not knowing what should become of them and their little ones. 
Others again melting in tears, seeing the poor little ones hanging about them, crying for fear and quaking with cold. Being thus apprehended, they were hurried from one place to another and from one justice to another, till in the end they knew not what to do with them. And some managed to escape to Holland, which began to set in motion the journey to America. Reminded that when John Bunyan was imprisoned uh, for not being registered to preach, the story is told about how he could see his blind daughter Mary standing on the street corner trying to sell pencils to keep the family with food. And he could see her from the prison cell. And all he had to do was say, I recant. I won't preach him anymore without a license. And he wouldn't do it. And such was the, was the grip and the courage of our pilgrim fathers who came to this land. Well, the third thing is he's the God who heals. He heals the sick. Look at Psalm 107, verses 17 to 22. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquity suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. It does, it does not mean they were picky about food. Their, their, their illness just made food offensive to them. They were at death's door. But what did they do? They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Here we move, we shift a little tone here to tell how, not only why, we should give thanks to God for this covenant love that never changes, never fails. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. Did you bring a sacrifice of thanksgiving in here today? And tell of his deeds in songs of joy. This is something you can do anywhere. You could have done this Thursday when you gathered with family. How thankful we are for so much that God has done. You can do that alone. The sacrifice of thanksgiving. Do your prayers personally, privately, as a family. Whatever group you gather in, do they have the tone of thanksgiving in them? Do you recognize that every time you take a morsel of food and put it into your mouth, even if it's Aunt Sally's finest dressing, Uncle John's greatest turkey, that you trace it back to, you trace it back to the hand of God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights in whom there's no shadow of turning. Do we recognize that? And what do we look like, by the way, when we, th when we think about our friends and fellow believers around the world to turn our nose up at food that's made available to us? There's a lot of implications that even go into just eating a meal. We're going to have our brothers and a sister in from Haiti, God willing, end of February, the 1st of March. Two of them have never been to the States. I'm right about that, correct? Correct have never been here. They will see more food in one day here than they see in a week, two weeks, three weeks. We need to model people who are thankful. To whom much is given, much is required. I can promise you if you've been among the Haitian people, they're a thankful people. They're thankful for anything. They're thankful when they have nothing because they know that they owe a debt to God that they cannot repay. Same has been true everywhere I've traveled outside the States. We ate basically the same food in Russia every day. I never saw a Bible school student turn his nose up. He never said, what, she again? Never happened. Never happened. Zambia, never happened. China, never happened. Oh, to be a thankful people. Is that us? Does this describe us? 
sacrifices of thanksgiving, tell of his deeds and songs of joy. This will be my story. This will be my song. I will tell of my Savior. For I'm free, and I will not cease to declare his goodness. This is our God. He's delivered some of you from death in the time that we've been together. Some of you have faced difficulties from many different fronts that you did not think you would survive or come through. Sudden grief, sudden illness, sudden loss. And yet here you sit. Here you sit. Because he is the God who heals. We're to give thanks for his steadfast love. Recognizing that even in our worst providences. He is the God who strengthens, who offers healing to us. Fourth, he's the God who rescues. He rescues the perishing. Look at verses 23 and following. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on great waters. This is a a psalm written about how God protects not only on the land, but he protects in the sea. This had particular affinity to our pilgrim fathers who, who loaded up on ships if you've ever been on one of these things or not, uh, we've had the opportunity, I forget the name of the one in Baton Rouge, it was, uh, it was a replica of the pilgrim ship, I believe. The what? The Golden Hind, thank you. And then we've been on the, 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 was it the Nina the Pinta and the Santa Maria replicas. Folks, I could hardly fit through the door. Uh, I mean, these people were in cramped quarters. You didn't ask on this ship, uh, can you tell me where the restroom is? Have you, have you checked to see what's for dinner on the, on the uh, what's that deck they call it on the cruises? The, the, you, some of you have been on cruises. What's that, the, the deck where they feed everybody? The li- huh? Every, every, every deck is food, right. The line, what? The Lido, the Lido deck. Have you checked the menu on the Lido deck tonight? Pass me some gruel. I mean, think about the conditions. And he rescued them. He's the God who did this. So some went down to the sea in ships doing business on great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. Now, what did they see? (laughs) Well, they saw the sea. They, They saw the ebbing and flowing of the sea. Look at this. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind. They faced storms where they thought they would perish. You can remember the disciples in the boat with Jesus. Jesus is resting calmly, and they go to wake him up. Pastor, Master, it's it's stormy. Don't you you care about us? In other words, we're about to drown here, and you're sleeping. We're about to go under. This this boat's going to take on so much water, we're going under. Well, they faced something like that, traveling over. This had a particular affinity to them. They'd seen the hand of the Lord. He commanded and raised the stormy wind. They understood the sovereignty of God over the weather, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, and then they went down to their depths. Now, I don't know if you've ever been seasick. This is a wonderful formula for seasickness. The rising on the way, the dropping out from under you to the bottom of the swell, and on and on. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Facing the forces of nature. So what did they do? Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still. Jesus speaking to the waves in the New Testament was not the first time that God has commanded a storm to be still. still. But when he does this in the New Testament, it is just the most graphic example because he stands up in the boat. It says, peace, be still. And like a domesticated dog who may be getting a little excited because neighbors are over or something, When the master of the house says, sit, the dog sits. That's what Jesus did to that storm. 
the sovereignty of God over the storm. Do you think he's sovereign over your circumstances? Do you think he can handle your circumstances? Our pilgrim fathers had absolute confidence in that, even though they lost some of their own loved ones, died on the passage over. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Verse 30, then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. No GPS, no contact with the Coast Guard, sailing west, praying to God they would reach land before they all died. I think I read where 12 of the households lost a loved one on the trip over or shortly thereafter. Well, how do you respond to that? Verse 31, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. You see, it would be a shame to get tired of hearing that refrain, to suggest, come on now, you know, this, this constant over and over. You can get tired of that in, first, in, in, in Psalm 136 unless you understand what you're saying. We're not going to read that psalm. It's too repetitive. We just don't, we don't like repetition. Yet listen to the significance. What do you do when life presses in? You cry unto the Lord. Now look, we should be faithfully in, in our devotions crying out unto the Lord. But when the squeeze comes, Jesus promised, in this world you will be squeezed. When the squeeze comes, what ought to come out of us is a cry unto the Lord. God, help me. God, I need wisdom. You, you've told me you, don't, you won't hesitate to give me wisdom. You won't scold me for being stupid in this situation. Lord, I need, I need to see what you see. I need to hear from you. I need to be guided by you. Lord, I need help. I need deliverance. I need strength. I need your touch. You're Jehovah Rapha. We've been playing, praying for people recently who've had some serious afflictions. You're just crying out, oh, Jehovah Rapha, God who heals, show yourself willing and able to touch and heal this person. And then you give him thanks. Thanksgiving. You see, uh, Thanksgiving, I think it was Adrian Rogers said this, Thanksgiving leads to thanks living. When you're not practicing being thankful, then you will not live thankful. And so they extol him. Notice this. Extol him in the congregation of the people. When you gather with the people, how are you doing? Oh, I'm pretty good under the circumstances. Well, okay, I guess. Well, let's just praise God. Why? Had a bad week. Whew. What does that say about us? No, no. Why do we praise him? Because his steadfast love never fails. His the term, the idea of steadfast means it is, it is unremitting. It doesn't have gaps. He doesn't take time out. He doesn't dole it out in thimbles. He is glad and delights in showing mercy and compassion to his children. Yes, there are consequences for our sin, but not, not the consequences leading to hell. The consequences, the Lord loves, he chastens, he, he brings us back into to line with his parental love. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders, what Josh said a while ago in 1 Corinthians 14 that we'll be looking at. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if you had the opportunity to bring someone who was Jesus Christ and, and they came in here they said well don't, people don't seem very happy they don't seem very excited now we're not talking about a grinning idiot chess or cat nonsense and we're not talking about a thrill up the leg nonsense we're talking about a, a deep understanding of the mercy and faithfulness and love and kindness of God shown to us infallibly in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his sinless life, his suffering death, his rising from the grave. We're talking about that 
being fixed in our minds and being a motivation that drives us, our God. See, so if you don't get out of your jam this week, don't forget that you have been delivered from the pit by the blood of Christ. And we should be able to give thanks for that, and particularly when we come together. This is the safest place in the world to give thanks to God, to shout hallelujah, to, to sing just, as, just with as much vigor as you have to sing, even if it's off key. You know what? The, the angels have a tuner, and they tune the people of God when we sing off key. They do it. They're masters at it. It doesn't sound that way. So where are you today? Come through Thanksgiving. Whew. Well, I'm glad that's over. Well, you know, maybe it's not realistic to try to feed 24, 25 people every day or even once a week. But we have entered a season that of all seasons in the course of the year should provoke us and fine-tune us and remind us and strengthen us and enable us to be a thankful people. If you've been out in the stores, you've been around grumblers. In fact, Karen and I were standing in a line recently, and something happened, and it, everything was going wrong with the, with the checkout <laughs> counter, you know, and, and something wasn't doing right, something wasn't scanning something, so we just stand there, and uh, she kept saying, I'm just so sorry. I said, that's no problem. That's no problem. And I thought as we walked back, she said, well, just thank you all for being so patient. And I thought, dear God, what must these people face all the time? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know how important I am, how busy I am? I've got to go places. I've got to God's people ought to just be able to chill and stand and bless some poor clerk who's stumbling and fumbling and maybe was trained seven days ago to use this scanner and use this. Just bless them. Just bless them. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Oh, yes, I did. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We of all people. When you start watching on TV the fights breaking out in the Black Friday lines and some mama slugging some other mama because she got the last doll. That's... Give thanks. Be a thankful people. And see, when you do that, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and say, wow, you're really a patient person. Or you may not have much of a life because you don't see me. No, so wait, let me tell you why. I used to be a lot like you. But then Jesus came into my life. And somehow when you know you're going to spend eternity with him, a few extra minutes in a line doesn't seem like much. To miss the last whoop de doo doll doesn't seem like much. I promise you, they'll make more of them. If they're, if they're settling out, they're going to make more of them. You know, we have so much reason to give thanks because of the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us, because he has sustained us. You've, some of you have come through stuff this last year that you didn't think you would, didn't know how you would, and yet here you are. He heals us. He blesses us. He rescues us. And you can have confidence that whatever you're going to face this week, next week, next month, next year, that the God who rescued you from the pit of hell is well able to do that in some other circumstance that's not tied to eternity. Do you know Jesus Christ today? Are you living for Jesus Christ today? Don't get lost. Don't get lost in the tinsel and all the trimmings. Above all else, remember him. Next week, God willing, if we live to see it, we're going to gather here, and we're going to push this table out a little farther so I can get behind it, and we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him because he has never forgotten us and he never will so for all who are christ followers here today give thanks with a thankful heart live thankfully for all who are not yet christ followers don't hang with the grumblers 
And forgive us when you see us grumbling and sending a contradictory message to what it means to know Jesus Christ. Come to him. Repent of your sin right where you are. Cry out to him in faith. They cried out to him. And every time they cried out to him, he heard them in their distress. You have every reason to believe he would hear you today. Come to Jesus. Be thankful to God for the greatest gift, his son, for sinners. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in Jesus' name. We thank you so much for your word. Just, just reading those two passages just burns into us that you're the God who shows steadfast love to his people. Unremitting love. Unrelenting love. Perfect love. That's who you are. Help us to live in the light of that. And when the, when the enemy of our souls wants to try to point out to us why we shouldn't be thankful, help us to demonstrate a, a disdain for that by being reminded to give thanks to you for your steadfast love. Show it to those here who are not yet followers of Christ and strengthen all who are to live in the covenant of grace. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.